Hello everyone, this is Daniel Bloodworth with the Easy Allies, and today I am joined and have the pleasure to be joined by uh, Gareth Coker, a composer on Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Hello everyone, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, why don't you start off just by uh, giving yourself a little bit of an introduction, some background, uh, and how you got involved with uh, Ori to begin with. Um, so I was relatively fresh out of the University of Southern California, getting started in my journey in music, and I was very active on various online forums, one of them including moddb.com, and Thomas Marler, the director of Ori, found me there. I don't know what he was doing on there, probably just looking for people who were desperate for work, I don't know. But uh, he then said we had this prototype of, um, of a game, it wasn't even called Ori at the time, and he said he liked, he liked a track, I, I finally remembered what track this was, like quite recently, it was a track that I did for a student film, very ambient, very mellow, kind of like would fit in the, the Ori world. Anyway, he, he liked that track, and then he was like, well, if you do the music for the prototype uh, that we're building to pitch to publishers, um, if we have a successful pitch, then you can do the full game. And at the time, I was like, sure, I'll do anything. Uh, so, obviously, that worked out, because here we are, uh, pretty much nine years later, and uh, yeah, Ori 1 came out in 2015. Uh, Ori 2 came out this March, and a bunch of stuff happened uh, in between as well, thanks to you know, thanks to the success of Ori. So it's been, yeah, it's been quite a ride um, that I can actually trace back to being on a forum on a relatively obscure website. Yeah. It's it's amazing how these things happen, though. Yeah, I, I kind of had a similar journey myself, where you know, you know, I had I had written as a student a, a bit, but you know, then I was just involved in a website on their forums, and then eventually. They're like, you're actually writing good stuff in forum posts. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you just never know. You just never know where, where work might come up on. So as long as you put your best stuff out there, you, you never know, who, at least in the case of music, you never know who's listening. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad it, glad it worked out, obviously. Um, and then, yeah, moving from the first game to the second, what was kind of the, the biggest themes and things that sort of carried over from one to the next? The, the things that carried over, I mean, I think... You know, with, when, it, when it comes to writing music for a game that's clearly uh, that's going to have a sequel, we, we wanted to retain the, the DNA of, of what was successful in the, the music for Ori 1, but try and expand upon it a little bit. There, there were a couple of things that we couldn't really do on Ori 1, either for budget or for technology reasons, that we, we, we could do on Ori 2. Uh, one of, one of the, the, the things I like to talk about the most is the is the boss fights in in Ori 2 because it's mm -hmm. not something we had we had the chase sequences in Ori 1 but we didn't have like direct confrontations with any uh, with with any large creatures whereas in this one you do and we probably could have done it in Ori 1 but we didn't have the audio middleware to do it but we did in the second one um, the the boss fight music is multi-phase it probably would have been fine to just do one big epic track that plays for the duration of the boss fight and loops until you win I mean, that's, that's okay, um, but I was like, we need to do better than just okay. Because we have all these boss fights have different phases, let's see if we can we tell like some kind of a story through, through, the, through the music during the boss fight. And it's pretty simple stuff. That's like the spider, more of the spider. Um, so you arrive at her like arena, mm -hmm. um, for want of a better word. And there's, then there's a little intro cutscene uh, where you lose control of Ori and you kind of have like the terrifying introduction of, of more of the spider. Um, and then you're plunged into the arena. Um, so you have the intro music, then you have the phase one music for the first arena. And that's your typical, you know, I'm scared of this giant spider. Oh my god, what am I going to do? How am I going to fight it? And then that plays for the whole time while you're in phase one. Eventually you get Mora down to a certain... Uh, level of HP and then the transitional scene starts where you have to do a chase scene which is kind of like up a tree trunk kind of thing um, and then you get spat out into the next arena and because you've now got more down to 50% HP it the music changes to something that's more optimistic and it plays the main theme it does combine it a little bit with Mora's music and it's also a callback to the uplifting music from the chase music from the first game which I know was quite popular so I was like let's uh, let's 
bring that back. Um, but it's, it, I didn't do it just because it was popular. It was because it was felt like the right thing to do. It's like I wanted to reinforce the player that they're actually winning the battle, and you can. And so continue. You're getting closer and closer and closer. And then, of course, there's a, an outro sequence as well. So it's really like five different segments of music to reflect one overall experience, but it should feel like one continuous piece. It's not something... Well, I mean, we never had to do it for the first game, but like that level of granularity is something that we wanted to... Certainly that I wanted to explore more in the, in the second game. But the, the key to getting that to be effective is having the music change without it being obvious that it's changing. I, I One of my pet peeves about a lot of uh, soundtracks is there's all... I think game music is generally brilliantly composed. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's rarely bad sounding music in games these days. I think a lot of it is really, really good stuff. But the, the, the key is now is in like, how well does it play back in the game? And, and one of my things is just like, you know, when you're going through a game and it's like, ta-da, here is the combat music. And it's like, well, okay, do I really need it to be that obvious that I'm in combat when the sound effects are already telling me I'm in combat? It's like, you'll notice if you play through Ori that when you are fighting regular monsters, which you don't have to kill, by the way, because you can completely ignore most of them. Of course, <laughs> most people most people will fight them because it gives them more uh, more spirit light, but, yeah. but you can, you can ignore them. But you'll notice that we don't use combat music because if you're just switching in and out of combat music, it just it just sounds gimmicky. It actually feels very gamey in a not good way. A philosophy, another philosophy that carried over is um, we only play combat music when you have to kill something to proceed. And the benefits of that are that without because it doesn't put so much emphasis on you know regular exploration combat. It means that when we do have combat, it actually matters and actually registers with the player. You know, the boss fight music is pretty loud, but it only happens like three or four times in the game. So that as a result, it has more impact. But when it, if it was loud in all combat scenarios, it would register less with the player. What else carried over? Uh, I mean, obviously the, the melodic theme for, for Ori, that's kind of a no-brainer. I think I'd be like shot down by the fans if I didn't reuse the theme in some way. Uh, but it's kind of just the obvious thing, if, the obvious thing to do. It's, it's funny, I, every so often I see a couple of comments online, it's like, oh, he didn't, he, he, he reused the theme too much. I'm like, too much, there's no such thing as too much. Like, if it, if it works in the, in, the, in the game, I mean, it's, it's like John Williams is reusing the Star Wars theme all the time. Like, because it's, first of all, if it's a strong theme and players relate to it and you want to hear it again, it's more about, like, where do you choose to use it? I spend a lot of time uh, playing the game and testing the game to make sure that the moments where we you know, want to have peaks um, have, the, have the right music playing. It's, it's one of the things I'm, I'm really grateful to Moon for is just like having the amount of access that I did. It's, it's not very common for composers to get every single build every day and, some, and honestly on some games it wouldn't even be appropriate but for this one which is quite a tight narrative experience there's just things you want to try over and over and over again to make and partially because there's so much music as well because it's, there is hardly any dialogue and so music's got yeah. to do a lot of the the heavy um heavy lifting um alongside animation if we take the ending of the game i'm not going to talk about the content of the ending but the ending is a cutscene that's the spirit willow cutscene that's not really a spoiler i think you know the one i'm talking about then it transitions seamlessly into the final boss fight which transitions into the final outro, which is actually three cutscenes back to back. And you can actually play all of the music continuously without a break, and it will still work as one piece of music, even though it covers about, depending on your ability, 20 to 30 minutes of, of, uh, of in-game time. And that stuff wouldn't work if it was composed in chunks and you just glue them all together. They, they've been composed keeping in mind that they need to flow continuously from one piece to another. Um, and I, I definitely, well, I might be able to do that, but it would just be a lot harder to do if I didn't have the kind of access that I did with Moon. Yeah, I think one, the, one of the things I did want to ask about was with that, that main theme and bringing it back and, you know, and, and as you're saying, like sometimes people can feel tired of a main theme and how you do that in a way that feels like familiar but not um dragging you down but actually making you excited to hear that come back right the um 
Yeah, I would say that like, I'm trying to think about the game now and where I used it because uh, it's been a while now. I haven't really thought about. I, I, I don't really. I haven't really. Now that I've shipped the game, it's like I haven't really thought about it too much. But the main theme um, in the first game, because it's your because it's Ori's first steps into the world. I felt it was. Like, I pretty much used the main theme in every environment Ori encountered. Um, because also the story was really about, you know, Ori's, like, naive journey around Nibel. Um, and he, you know, he, he obviously knows what he's doing, but he doesn't really. Whereas Ori 2, it's like, oh, I'm, it's, it's, the, he's treading a familiar path, even though it's a, it, it's a different world. I, so I was like, I don't need to use the main theme as much because we're not in Ori's homeland. We're in, we're in Niwen. As a result, it meant I could pick and choose the moments much more carefully where to place Ori's theme. However, a couple of other benefits are we added a bunch more characters to the game and you spend more time on screen with them. I think that's like the one thing that I was very grateful for. One of my favorite scenes in the game is when you enter the Silent Woodlands for the first time and Shriek is, uh, is stalking you mm. throughout throughout that and it's like great I now can just literally use Shriek's theme and just I can throw in a little bit of Ori's theme in here because this because a moment is coming up um, again I'm not gonna spoil what happens because it is a key scene in the game but it's just like I could play the themes off each other um, likewise whenever Ku's on screen it's like I don't need to have Ori's theme I can use can use Ku uh, and, and with the environments being as varied as they are it's like I can make them sound like their own thing. Ori's already been on a voyage of discovery in the first game, and so I can now just make the music reflect the environment rather than making sure I put Ori's theme into, into everything. I guess uh, the one other place I did put the theme though is the the boss fights and the chase sequences because again they're they're highlights of the game though the the, the the chase scenes the philosophy with the chase scenes the chase scenes are slightly less tense this round because I felt that if I put myself in Ori's shoes he'd be like oh we're doing a chase thing again like <laughs> not not a chase thing but like you know what I mean it's like I've done this before and I feel more confident in doing it. That was at least my mindset. I was like, what would Ori feel? It was like, oh, we're doing this again. Where, so so the, the, the chase scene music is slightly more uplifting than it was in the first game, where it was definitely more tense. Now the boss fight music in comparison is definitely way more tense until the shift towards the end of the boss fight. So it's, it's just like little things like that is like how you, I can use the theme, but I can make it feel different depending on how like the accompaniment is, whether I'm using different instruments or the, or the harmony or whatever. There's, if you have a decent melody, there's enough ways with, you know, good music techniques to, to make it feel different. I mean, I, I don't need to, you know, go through a long list of games that have used melodies in different ways. I mean, there's there's, there's tons of them out there. What, one of the things I like about the Ori melody is that, frankly, it can be a get out of jail card sometimes because it's like, you know, if, I've, if I'm struggling for a scene, I'm going to be like, well, maybe, am I justified in putting the Ori theme here? Um, and I try it, well okay it feels a bit cheap to put it there then i'll but then but sometimes it does work so yeah i guess the point is is that i don't just throw it in with reckless abandon um there there is thought as to when and when and where it plays because i'm aware that it's a kind of a silver bullet kind of thing it, it, it's very effective when i use it. i get and i guess with the second game i could really pick and choose where to put it rather than plastering it across the game because we had so many other themes that we could we could use as well Yeah, when you're talking about the chase sequences, that was actually one of the things, you know, that I, I had noticed is, you know, I think even, uh, and, and you mentioning this with boss fights as well, uh, I think it's interesting that even in moments like that, that you're still focused on telling the story, the, telling the journey, rather than just adding tension to that moment. Well, I think, I think that's the thing. I think when, uh, when looking at this game, it, 
there's 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 like the the basic level of writing music for games is you know write music that fits the scene that that is like the most basic job and pretty much every composer is doing that and it's like it's like the bare minimum but a saying that i cannot take responsibility for and I, i'm afraid i can't bring the source to mind but it's 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 common amongst many composers is music should also communicate ex what you can't see on screen like that's when it really can elevate things it's like you know, a lot of the time i i like to think of the the, the soundtrack for ori as taking a, the point of view of ori it's like what would ori be feeling right now in a musical sense that will help the player better connect with what ori is feeling and just adding your typical tense music it's going to get you it's going to tell you that the music is tense but it's not really going to tell you how ori's feeling I, I discovered this really on the first game with the Ginzo Tree sequence, which was the first like big set piece that the Moon Studios had actually finished for the game. And it was kind of, I, th I think that was a revelation, not just for me, but for the entire studio. It was like, once we finish that sequence, and I don't just mean the actual chase, I mean everything that leads up to it, and then the cutscene after, like that whole block, I was like, I think we were all like, this is what Ori like is. Mm. That told, like the, my original approach for the, the the actual water chase part was to do like exactly like what you said. And it was just I just added tense music, there was drums, there was strings, everything was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm like, well, this this is great, but it's just it felt it actually felt flat. And I'm like, what is it missing? You know, funny enough, we were just talking about the theme. And I was just like, well, what would happen if I added the theme on top, which is and but made it just more heroic than what we've heard before. And it literally just solved everything. It was just, all of a sudden, because it was a theme that had been echoed throughout the environment throughout, it meant that chase scene actually truly mattered um, because we were playing the theme in quite a, an emphatic way. And that, I think, resonated with anyone who was playing with that sequence, of course. <laughs> will uh, gloss over the fact that many people struggled on that sequence the first time through but I, it was reassuring to, to to read some comments like the music forced me to keep on going because we have the quick respawn time and the music doesn't have the uh, lights camera action reset it just continues to loop it doesn't stop and i think that kind of pushed push players to keep on going and that like template for the chase scenes uh, is, is just another thing that, that carried over but it's also just reminded me that it's like the music shouldn't just be functional it needs to try it doesn't need to do it in every scene it just in the key scenes it does need to try and tell you something that you're not already seeing um on on screen in terms of uh your your instrumentation what was kind of the things that fed into uh, what you use different instruments in different areas for. Oh man, this is like this is like a, a PhD level essay in itself. Because <laughs> uh, because I, I mean I one of the nice things about doing a sequel. I mean generally if you're doing a sequel, you have you know uh, more resources and more room to experiment. Um, that comes with its own pitfalls, by the way. Like sometimes you can have too much room to experiment. One of my main collaborators. collaborators that's an interesting word. Uh, collaborators um, is uh, a woman called uh, Kristin Nagus, and she is a woodwind specialist. She has, I don't know, two to three hundred wind instruments, mm. and um, there's a lot of woodwind melodies in in Ori. I would say actually a lot more in the second game than there are in the first. And you know, it's a game set in a forest. Forests are made of wood. You know, you should use woodwind. But there are so many instruments to choose from. What I would end up doing, I'd be like, Kristin. Here's here's a melody. Play play it on like a bunch of different instruments, and let's just figure out which one's the best. Um, and that just you know led me to discovering a whole bunch of instruments that I'd never even heard of. Wow. Um, I discovered that there's such thing as a crystal flute. Um, you know, it, it looks like a flute, but it's 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 apparently made of crystal. Um, and a bunch of uh, we we used uh, a fujara, which is a Slovakian harmonic overtone flute. We used that a little bit in um, the sandworm chase. We use an instrument called the Quena, which is a uh, na Native American flute, and or a Native, sorry, South American, and yeah, just like a whole bunch of different Irish whistles. I only thought there was like the one generic Irish whistle, but apparently there's like seven or eight different kinds of whistles. And she she just knows all of this stuff and kind of like I tell her what tone I want, and then she's like, okay, I'm gonna deliver that deliver that tone, and I. Kind of like was able to to pick and choose um, a, from from like a nice selection. Um, so there are a lot of wind instruments in the game, but they all sound slightly different, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, that's very cool. 
another thing that I did um, specifically for the Moldwood Forest. So, so it would be very easy to do the stereotypical creepy strings sound for a spider stalking you to the very atonal, very dissonant. And I was like, I don't want to do that because it feels... I, I'm not making Ori the horror movie. It, like, mm. it still needs to feel like Ori. And dissonance and atonality is not something that really fits into the Ori world. Because even Moldwood is still kind of picturesque in its dark, weird way with its doors that are made of bugs. And you, you know, you're stepping over wings the whole time. And there's also the firefly element where you know, you're, 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 you're in darkness but a, a firefly is guiding you through. So I'm like... You know, how can we make this you know interesting and we I eventually came up with a um, an idea to to use the strings but have them play normal chords but in a very unconventional way it's the way we normally write for strings is to write violin one violin two viola cello bass that's pretty conventional then so you might have 12 to 18 violins and then 10 violas and eight cellos four basses whatever um, and they're playing five lines of music, and that's that, that's pretty much it. Well, I decided to give literally every single player something unique to do. Oh, they were wow. all playing like kind of it's yeah, it was a pain to actually mm -hmm. notate because it's just a lot of lines of music. They were all playing like slightly different variations of the same idea, but because they were all doing the same thing slightly differently, I mean, we got these chords that feel like they're subtly moving and shifting. And if you listen. The, the, the track is just called Shadows of Moldwood. It's one of, it's, I, I'm quite happy to say it's one of my favorite tracks that I've composed, like, ever. If you listen to that track, it's it's constantly shifting and undulating, but at its core is still a fundamental, like, melody that is actually Moore's theme, um, which you hear in a much faster version when she's on screen. Because she's supposed to be stalking you throughout the environment. Like, the if you if you stay in one place for too long in darkness, it's it's game over. Um, or at least respawn. Um, so I wanted to like have the feeling of you being constantly stalked, and the only way to do that was to feel like the strings were constantly moving. If we'd had them play traditionally, they'd have been able to do that, but it wouldn't have felt quite like the way it feels. So having all of those different like string lines where they were all just doing slightly, slightly different things was a really like nice uh, way to make that area just feel very, very alive. And then, like, after the interaction with, with Mora and the boss fight, um, the music shifts completely to be the same theme, but it's much more uh, resolved. Uh, I've managed to say that it's resolved without telling what actually goes down. I've, I've, I've clearly talked about that scene before because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like how, how to talk about the game without spoiling it is like, is like a challenge. I mean, yeah, I'll probably have a, a little note on here anyways. Cause, you know, <laughs> some right. people are really sensitive about yeah. you know, even seeing... Some Great. Boss yeah, and then and then really with all of the environments, it's just like I, I take a look at the environment. I mean, the way I work with with Ori is I record myself playing the game, and then I bring uh, that video, which is just with the sound effects. There's no background music, so it's just a video, the sound effects. I bring that into my music software, and then I just literally stare at the screen and experiment with different sounds and different ideas until there's something that I feel connects with the visuals. Now. So yes, the score is basically my taste, but it's taste that's based on hours and hours and hours of playing the game before anyone else has. So I wouldn't say that there are any... I think I think the area that I probably was the least sure about, because it's quite different to the rest of the game, um, was the Luma Pools. Okay. The Luma, the, so the Luma Pools is very, very different in context with the rest of the score. But my justification was for it, first of all, it's, it's clearly the brightest area in the game after the desert. It's very colorful. And yes, it is. there is some danger there, but it just doesn't feel like it. Like, it feels, it's, it's much more sparkly. The, the colors are uh, cyan and pink. And I was like, this is the one place in the game other than the, the Wellspring Glades where I feel like we can kind of hark back to the slightly more optimistic tone of Ori and the Blind Forest. And it's it's fun navigating the Luma Pools. I think, I think one thing that Moon really, really nailed, I mean, Moon nailed a lot of things with the controls, but uh, the swimming and the jumping out of the water and the water dash, I mean, you you can spend a lot of time just doing that, going in and out. And it's, it's just very fun chaining all of the different moves together. And I'm like, this area is just fun and it just doesn't feel right there's plenty of other places in the in the in the game where we can you know be quite 
heavy and dark with the music and this just felt like a, a place to try something different. But I remember a few people on the team weren't sure and I was just like, give it time because it's quite it's quite different and then see how you feel like after you've been in it for a while and well, it eventually stayed in and it, it, apparently it's a popular track. I think my favorite comment is uh, that I've seen is like, Moon finally made a water level that people like because uh, <laughs> apparently water levels are not popular in yeah. games that would that was that was one i wasn't sure about because also harmonically it's quite different i mean we're heading into jazz harmony territory there which is not not really what ori does but i'm like well it's 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 different and that's why i, I hope it stands out and it's the only place in ori one and one and two that that feels like that similar with moldwood it's the only place which has that creepy strings thing so uh, it's not something I put over the rest of the game. But there is like a thought process that goes into the instrumentation with every single environment, as opposed to like doing a film or a, a game with a much, which is set in one environment. You're generally going to have one palette like that you're calling upon. But with Ori, you kind of have to hit the reset button every time you enter a new environment because because the visual change is so different. Well, the music needs to support that. You know, we couldn't put the Luma Pools music in the desert. It just wouldn't work. The through line to make sure that the music sounds consistent. It's funny because people call Ori an orchestral score, but it actually it the orchestra is just a part of it. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing for people to find the. I, I understand. Score, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's 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 yeah. If it's, you hear live instruments, it's an right orchestral exactly. Score, yeah. But there's a lot of other elements that make each area unique. The orchestra is kind of the glue that holds everything together, and also the themes and melodies are the kind of thing that gives the score its consistency. Um, but that gives me room with all of the non-orchestral stuff to make each area sound like it's its own special thing. Yeah, that was actually yeah one of the things that I really had felt about the game is that you know these um, these environmental tracks are they're not just like background noise. It's like it makes you know it's like you're trying to make people feel like you're in there uh yeah it's inkwater it's, marsh was my first point when i'm like oh I'm, i just want to stop and sit in this for a little while well that's the thing i, I mean i think when um we, we tried to do a lot with the storytelling with, with just visual storytelling and, and again because there's so little dialogue it's like music music can open up a gateway for you to connect with the game on a, a deeper level it's like you know, and there are some parts where like the music is kind of leading you on a bit in terms of you know what the emotional vibe of the scene is but there are there are places where it's just it just it's designed to give you a space to interpret however you want it to, to, to interpret it because not everyone's going to respond to a game in the same way but just doing functional ambient music isn't isn't enough for this game we want people to you know feel as close to ori as as possible and that i mean that comes back to my granularity thing again and while and while we're on the subject of environmental music there's only one environment in the game where the music doesn't change and that's actually in the the wellspring glades which is your sanctuary area but as you're completing various tasks in each environment there's often a like a switch point where the music the environmental music will change a good example of that is in the very opening just after the prologue's finished you have your you know slightly somber uh opening because it's the opening of the gameplay and you've just been split up from coup that's not really a spoiler because it's the opening 11 minutes of the game and you you know your objective is to to find coup and so you're exploring you're kind of lost it's just it's dark and stormy and the music is kind of sad and wistful um, and then eventually you come across the first uh, the first ancestral tree and you pick up the sword and then the environmental music shifts it's the same melody but it's more it's got a more optimistic accompaniment most people probably won't notice it because it is the same melody but it is the kind of thing that you feel over a long period of ga uh, gameplay time the other example I like to highlight and this was probably overkill, but I felt like doing it anyway, because it actually wasn't that much extra work. Um, in the ancient wellspring, there's this uh, puzzle room. Uh, it's mainly for platforming, and it rotates. Um, I saw you smile. You clearly recall it. Um, so each time you pull the lever to rotate the room, the music actually... There's a new music cue that plays. It's based on the one that precedes it, but it's slightly faster, and it's slightly higher in pitch, and it's slightly busier. And each time you pull the lever, 
that happens again and again. And it's not just a cheap trick where I've like done a, I've pressed, a, I've loaded up a plugin and um, you know done a cheap pitch shifting technique. It is actually a fresh recording each time. It is complete overkill. But there are some, pe and there are some people who won't even hear like all of the different variations because they'll just be able to like use their platforming skills to to get through it in like 20 seconds. But I have seen some people struggle in that room, and so this, so and so, so they actually do hear the full. The, it's about like 75 seconds for each variation. Wow. Yeah, it's just like those little details to, to make sure that the environment like evolves as you play through it um, helps, I think, helps the player feel like... I, I always wanted to make sure the player felt like they were moving forward. Um, and there are those subtle shifts in every environment in the game. Um, and then there's another uh, puzzle that I remembered. Um, it, was, it was basically a musical puzzle. I'm trying to remember where it oh, was. Yes. Midnight Burrow, the entrance? Yes, yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The one that the one that people are like, how do I do this? And I'm like, it's right there in the background. <laughs> um, I'm like, I'm just like, I'm gonna let the internet figure this out. But yeah, it's it's funny because because some some people, th that's the kind of puzzle. That some people, you either get it immediately because um, you're able to make the connection with the background. And I remember there's some people on Moon uh, on on Moon's team who are like, I don't get it. I, I cannot figure it out. Um, it's just it's just, and you'll see that with puzzles in all kinds of games. I have the same problem in some games myself. I look at a puzzle and I just can't figure it out. And I go online and it's like the most obvious solution ever. I'm like, how on earth could I not figure that out? And it was right there. Actually, actually my own parents uh, play play Ori. Uh, Ori's the only platformer that my dad's ever played and he definitely wouldn't play a platformer if I hadn't worked on it. And he was like, we were, we were trying to figure out this puzzle for the longest time. And I was like, well, did you figure it out? And then he was like, yes. And we felt really stupid when we didn't, when we didn't realize what it was. Uh, but yeah, the bell puzzle, we, we actually did want to, we actually, there was plans at one point to do something more elaborate with music, but it's, it's because it was like gating off an era. I was like, we can't make it, you know, we can't make it too complex. And you know, three bells is, is, is reasonable. It, do you think that maybe because this is like one of your first games that you've worked on that you're, you're able to bring more to Ori than people would expect from a quote unquote simple platformer or side scroller? Well, I think uh, I think while I, whilst I'd like to think that it probably I would probably want to credit the team as well for giving me the platform to do that because I cannot write the music that I'm able to write without the without the visuals and the gameplay and the design like uh, and the story to be able to do that. I mean, all of my decisions and this isn't just a you know a cop out with me just like oh, I've got to praise the team. No, it's it, it really is the truth. Like a, a lot of my decisions are based on what I'm experiencing and what I'm playing and what I'm seeing. The way the game is made, in my opinion, completely justifies the music approach. I mean, it's uh, not every game needs wall-to-wall -wall music, but but Ori just does because it, and and especially in the second game, it's like well, we've got to do it now because that's the DNA that we've established in the first game. It would feel very, very different if there was less music. Um, it would still, I think it would still work as a game. It would just be a much more hyper-realistic game. And if you, if you look at the visuals, it's a world you want to get lost in and the music needs to, to support that. I think if we made it you know, more realistic, I think it would be, I think it would just be too, you know, too cutting and too, too dry. It just wouldn't feel like a, well, it wouldn't feel like a fantasy um, and it wouldn't, like a, a, a game with like this level of animation and visuals, it elevates the music, and the music they, they kind of elevate each other. Whereas if I think if Ori was set in a more realistic setting, I can't even imagine what that would look like. Some CG nightmare, I imagine. <laughs> but like, it, I just I actually just don't think it would be be as effective. I mean, one of the benefits of this art style is that the animation team can do all of this cool stretchy animation. I mean, you've seen how Ori moves; it looks it looks phenomenal. There's, and there's there's stuff that you can do to exaggerate certain moments that you couldn't get away with if it looked more realistic. I think that's the answer I was looking for. I think wait, I think it gives us greater range, um, and it gives the score greater range than if it was set in a more like hyper realistic fantasy setting, where it's where if you if you overwrite, and I have this problem all the time, I overwrite anyway. I'm always having to try and scale things back. Um, but if you do too much, then it ends up just feeling saccharine. In Ori. The, the way the game is made, it it justifies like really piling on in certain moments with with all the visuals and with the with the big music. I think you know it, is it really that different to 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 what Pixar are doing or Disney or what they're doing. I mean when the, when Disney, if you look at the old Disney movies, when 
in The Lion King when uh, when Mufasa dies. I mean, they pile on. Like, and, and I'm not talking about the CG remake. I'm talking about the, the original right, 1994. Yeah, yeah. You know, when that when that moment happens, it's like first of all, it's a terrifying visual, but then they're they're piling on with the music as well, and it's it's incredibly powerful. Uh, because it, it's 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 a moment that's been built up to, and I just I just don't think it can work in the same way um, with a, with a different look. So a lot of my decisions are um, are based on what I'm seeing. I mean that said, it's obviously you know it's obviously has a special place in my heart because it was the first major title I worked on, and um, and you know it, it launched obviously a lot of different opportunities for me. Um, and I, I think I'm just glad that I got to be able to do the second one because on the first one I was like I'm not I'm not done in this world yet like it's uh, I, I feel like there's there's more I can do with the Ori theme and there's more like different sounds I can explore uh, now if you ask me it's like you know what if there's Ori down the road well first of all I don't know if there's Ori down the road but uh, but second of all it's like you know it's like I've I've told all I can tell with Ori right now in terms of music but if there's you know if there was a compelling story in the future to be told then that's then then that would excite me but it all it always depends on like the, the story for me if, if the story's interesting and the the world looks great then it, it really can help me come up with the um, give give me the inspiration to come up with the music that's necessary for the for the game and the way I determine that is just by playing the hell out of it yeah and speaking of those opportunities you just it was just recently announced that you're going to be working on Halo Infinite. Uh, I mean obviously but already been working on it but yep. we haven't got to hear much of that yet um, how is that kind of led in there? What can you tell us about that so far? Um, so, so that's obviously. I mean, I can't talk too much about it, but like, it's it's. Uh, what I can say is that it's a completely different process to working on the Ori team with the Ori team. Obviously, three four three is structured completely differently, but it's obviously there's some you know there's some nice benefits. It's Halo um, and the. The, the resources for a composer are you know pretty much unsurpassed it's like we've it's been it's been fun like just exploring that whole uh, that whole world for which you know I've been I've known since I've been gaming so um, and and I mean also the other new thing is uh, for me is um, collaborating with another composer um, because there's there's a lot of music in the game because it's, it's a big game and uh, yeah, just bouncing ideas off off one another. So that's that's been a new experience. But and, and, yeah, the and other who new are you experience. working with that again? Uh, Curtis Schweitzer. He did okay. the music for Starbound. Um, that's probably what he's most known for. Um, and uh, yeah, he he's been working on it for for slightly longer than I have. But uh, we're kept in check by a music supervisor who music supervised on God of War and Spider Man, and uh, yeah, has a lot of experience working with different composers and uh yeah it's um it's it's definitely been a uh, an interesting uh, an interesting ride i mean going back going back further with with ori i mean because it kind of got me into the microsoft ecosystem yeah. um uh it led to me being able to work on minecraft with various expansions that they've got i mean the, the, i put out like six albums for minecraft um, they're all just on spotify well they, they bring out all of these little expansions right i mean they've, they've got hundreds of them at this point um but there was this series called uh the mythology uh, the, just a mythology series it's, they, did, they did uh greek mythology themed minecraft egyptian chinese and norse mythology those were great because they were all projects that were like yeah we need an album of norse themed music and we need it done in six weeks uh composed arranged orchestrated recorded mixed mastered done and i'm like Okay, challenge accepted. Th those those were nice little things to do because it's like you just have to focus on writing a certain style of music and uh, get it done. Yeah, there's um, and there's some you know there's some other things in the pipeline too that have that have opened up because of Ori led to Minecraft Norse mythology, which led to Darksiders Genesis, <laughs> which is you know that is a pretty crazy leap yeah. when you actually think about it but that is how the director of Darksiders Genesis found my music he found it when he was on listening on Spotify was, I think he was looking for Norse themed music and then he just discovered it on Spotify and then he was like oh, I'll just get in touch and I'm like oh great it was actually not he didn't hire me directly because of Ori I think he knew of my work on Ori but then he was like oh wait he did this as well and it's completely different um, and then I ended up on Darksiders Genesis which is about as opposite as the score for Ori as you can possibly get because it's very heavy um and there's a lot of rock and roll elements to it as well. Yeah, it's just interesting how thing one thing can lead to another, and obviously Ori has you know led to Halo. Although the music supervisor for Halo 
said to me he was like you know we're obviously aware of your work on ori but actually they you know there's not a huge amount of crossover with ori's music and halo's music as you can imagine the ambient music may be more so but in terms of palette not really um, but the palette they actually referenced was my work on arc and i was like wait really okay great someone's listened to it um so uh yeah it's it's just interesting like how different things cross over but ultimately the I'd like to think that I put decent work out there and hopefully people are listening to it and that's, you know, that's where opportunities come from. But yeah, Ori definitely spawned a, a lot of it. So it's of course close to my heart. Is there uh, anything else you want to uh, say before we, we wrap up? Uh, I don't think so. Just um, I'm gonna I'm gonna shill my Twitter account. That's the best place if you if you want. I, I will say this. I say this. I say this pretty much on everything now. Like it, if you have a specific question, I'm I really like deep and specific questions rather than um, uh, especially on Twitter. Like when it's um, um, uh, when people ask me really specific questions, I give them really specific answers. And I, I have gone as far as posting like actual notation in response to people um, to give people a, so if you want like if you have a really specific question that you want answered that I didn't like address today or in any other thing that I've done, then that's the place to ask me because the chances are all it'll probably because if it's really specific, I'll be like, huh, I've never thought of that before. I think I'm. I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna research this answer and and, and go to town on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm very. I'm. I'm pretty active on there. Um, obviously, um, yeah. The, uh, there's everything else I can't talk about because it's subject to NDA. But there's uh, uh, there's stuff even beyond Halo Infinite that's coming around the corner. So uh, which I'm excited about. So uh, yeah. Um, but yeah. Thank you for having me as well on this uh, on this and allowing me to ramble on about Ori. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's great to be able to talk about music again, and I got a little bit of a taste with some of the GDC talks last week with uh, Austin Winery and, and Will Roger. I listened to their their sessions. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's been great. And uh, if any of you uh, at home have enjoyed this, uh, Easy Allies, uh, we are primarily funded on Patreon. So go to Patreon.com/EasyAllies, uh, and uh, you can see all the different reward levels and stuff there. That is our primary means of support. Uh, so thank you to everyone who is pitched in. And thanks again, Gareth, for joining me. No problem. Thank you so much.